Welcome back to Successful Living. We're joined with uh, Chad Kritzis from HomeSmart. Hey, Good to see you again. You Welcome too. back. Thanks. Um, before we get into the myths of real estate and kind of debunking some of that stuff and giving us some facts, last year was, you know, in general, the economy was really, really good. And I know the housing market the last time we talked, very good. Can you kind of tell us how that end of the year started to look uh, in 2019? Absolutely. It, it stayed pretty much through the year. It stayed straight through to a seller's market. I think market. we have a, uh, sorry. sorry. Uh, but I think we have kind of a, a clip up if we can, uh, or a little illustration if we can pull that up. Yeah. It stayed throughout the year pretty much a seller's market. Some of the towns are most of the states kind of almost balancing out to about what they call a balanced market. Single family prices up uh, year, month over month for the end of the year. Prices were up 8.3%. Uh, pending sales, which is a, a big number for this time of year, pending sales are up 23%, wow. which is a big number, meaning coming into the, you know, the first quarter of 2020, there's going to be a lot of sale volume. Um, and then the sale numbers were actually down 5% for the end of the year. Uh, condo prices up 22%, which is the highest median price on the record um, for Rhode Island MLS. Also, the number of sales down 4%. So you're seeing lower sales, you're seeing lower inventory. Um, and then the single family, uh, the multifamily properties this year just, I mean, took off all the way around. The prices are up 12% and the sales are up 7% month over month. Wow. Um, you know, one of the quick questions, on a pending, and this is just me just wondering, yep. in most cases, do most of those pendings percentage-wise get closed? I mean, is I, it? I, I'd hope so. <laughs> I mean, there's always issues, right? Mostly, yeah. when a deal falls apart, usually it's over inspections. Um, hopefully, it's not over financing because hopefully, the, you know, the buyer's ready to roll. Uh, but you can, sometimes you run into appraisal issues, especially when the market's skyrocketing the way it is. Yep. The house might not necessarily appraise because you might not have the comps or the comparable sales to value, you know, to justify the value. But yeah. that's that's just, that happens in a seller's market when the prices are escalating like that. Right. So the market has just continued towards the end of the year. I think we talked in November. Mm -hmm. The market's just continued to keep, you know, going in the right direction. Yes. And seeing. even the last couple of weeks, even Christmas and the New Year's, really strong. I mean, still signing offers and contracts. Well, that's it's great. Been straight. Great for everybody. Yeah, good yeah. for everybody. Yeah. 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 Um, so, you know, we had talked a little bit uh, earlier in the week just about, you know, what are some things that some viewers would be interested in. Mm -hmm. And so I think in any industry, like people always ask me, oh, well, you do this this way. What do you kind of like? Th they always kind of have this convoluted view yeah. of what you do right. for work and how it all kind of works. And I think we had talked about, hey, this would be a great way to kind of talk about, yeah. hey, there's here's some of the things that people think you do, but what does it really mean? Or, and so one of the ones that we talked about first was, is that you don't need to get pre-approved to find your perfect home. Can you can you kind of speak to that? I mean, does it Absolutely. make sense to get pre-approved, not pre-approved? How does that all work? Well, we just said we're, we're literally in a seller's market, right? So if you're, if a seller's market means there's, <clears throat> it's better for the sellers, there's less inventory, there's more buyers competing. So if you find that perfect house, so if you and I go out on Saturday, we go look at three houses and you fall in love with one, but you're not pre-approved, you then need to go through the pre-approval process, which means, one, you're not really ready to buy, so that offer you're, you're making really has no validity because you don't have a pre-approval letter to go with it. Okay. Any seller in the right mind is going to say, well, where's your pre-approval letter? Or their agent, more importantly. Um, <clears throat> the other part of that, too, is I don't want to take out, just for example, I don't want to take out a look at $600,000 homes when your pre-approval is for $375,000 homes. Because you're, of course, you're going to fall in love with something you can't have, right? That's, that's yeah. the way it works. So the pre-approval process is, is in the, in the home buying process is the most important part of it. How long does that take? So let, let's say someone came to you and said, hey, Chad, you know, I'm looking for this house. Let's go out and look for it. And then they kind of push you to go look for it. And then you're like, well, do you have a pre-approval? How right. long in general? Like, I know it's probably different for everybody, mm -hmm. but how long would it take to say, okay, today is Sunday and... When can we start looking and I'm pre-approved? I mean, you can probably get it done the same day. I mean, a lot of the mortgage okay. guys, I mean, they'll just send you a link. You do it all online now. And oh. then from there, you got to upload your, you know, your pay stubs, your tax returns, and all the things to, to justify. But, <clears throat> excuse me, with basic numbers, they can give you a, a pre-approval just based on, you know, income and expenses, debt-to-income ratios, that kind of thing. Okay. So in coordination okay. with you, if they... If they're, before they call you, it might be helpful that they call a mortgage broker and just say, hey, listen, I just need a pre-approval letter. That happens pretty quickly, and then they come to you, and that makes your job a lot easier. A lot easier. Or if yeah. vice versa, if somebody calls me, they say off a sign, and I'll say, oh, hey, Rob, you know, do you have a pre-approval? Then I can just set them up with a couple of okay. mortgage guys. All right. It's a pretty streamlined process. We all tend to work together pretty well. Great. Okay. Uh, the next one that we took a look at, you get a better deal when buying a home through the listing agent. Of course. Right? That, that's a common one. We hear that that's all the true. time. Not true. Nah. <laughs> right. uh, so the way it works is that the, most of the time, and I'm speaking Rhode Island agency law, most of the time the, the selling agent, the listing agent, is under contract as a, a, um, a client representative of the seller. So their job is to look out for the best interest of the seller. 
right? And now, just be they sign a contract like anybody else, right? It's yeah. got a it's got a price, it's got a fee, and it's got dates. It's a contract. So just because they go directly to the selling agent, that doesn't mean that their their selling agent's changing their fee. The fee is the fee. It's already determined in the contract. Okay. So more importantly, you got to remember is their job is to work for the seller. So they they really are, are probably a transaction facilitator for the buyer, which means they're they're typing up the contract, they're putting it together, but they work for the seller is the bottom line. And think about that, you know, you get into an inspection negotiation, something's mm -hmm. wrong. They're going to do everything they can to protect the seller, not the so buyer. So it's who comes to them first always, right? So right. can someone actually represent both or no? You can. There's there's obviously more documentation for it that has to be done. Okay. But honestly, I don't I do not do it. I just, it doesn't, it, 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 it's the best way to get yourself in a boatload of trouble is represent both sides. All right, so this makes me think, so if I wanted to buy a house and I've got my own agent and you're the seller, by having my own representation, am I doing myself any disservice because in my mind I'm thinking, well, the guy who's selling it might not want to entertain it because he's going to make more money if he can find a buyer on his own. Well, that's, I mean, what he makes at the end of the day, I mean, I, you know, I can't tell you about his mindset, but yeah. most of the time, and I'm generally speaking, that, and that's what I'm wondering. I mean, the buyer's it, agent doesn't cost the buyer anything because per MLS, the core broker is paid yeah. through an MLS fee. So that's, that's usually the way it works. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So... For sale by owner, saved, lot, saved lots of money. And I mean, this one is close to me. If I went back 15 years ago, my yep. wife and I, oh, it was 2006, we had a condo in Providence. Yep. And I said, I'm going to sell it myself, right? And I think we've got a lot of experience selling real estate. Oh, a ton. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely yeah. not. I actually looked in the paper a few times. And I said, well, that guy sold his. We have the same condo. He sold yep. his for 280. I'm going to sell mine for 280. And I did that for six straight months. And I always, every time that it went from 280 to 270, I, I followed it, went 270, and that one would sell. Then one would go to 260, and that one would sell. So I kind of learned early on, I'm like, I am not selling this thing on my own, nor did I know anything else. So I don't know if mine is just unique, but it sounds like, you know, a home doesn't need, well, for sale by owner saves a lot of money, probably not, and tell me about that. All right, well, let's talk about national stats, right? The National Association of Realtors gives us lots of stats to talk about. So and the median price of a single family home sold for sale by owner last year was $200,000. The median sale price of homes sold with an agent was $280,000. That's a national fact. Yeah. So <clears throat> if you're saving $10,000 in fees but losing $80,000 in your sale price, are you really winning? Right. Right. So the, and the other part of it is 89% of all sales are with agents nationally. So that's only 11% that are done either for sale by owner, or family to family member, you know, estate, whatever it is. But 89% are done agent to agent. Yep. So the other thing is, like you said, it, um, w when you do that, you're, like, where's your exposure? I hate to say it, I'm not going to use the big search engine names because I don't like most of them, but it's yeah. not necessarily evil. As a for sale by owner, you're not paying them monthly fees to get your home to the top. You're, I mean, maybe you are, but you're probably not hiring a professional photographer, the drone. You're, you're not doing a lot of the marketing things. 82% right. of the clicks on our website are on photos, right? So, the, you know, you have to, it's online marketing, photos. You know, you got to get the people in. They got to want to see the house to sell the house. Yeah. And, I, and I would assume less emotion when you have oh, someone wow. representing you. Like I think about what I do in my business, and people get emotional with the stock market, and they do whatever. Some people tell me the biggest thing you can do for me is take the emotion out of it and manage this like a professional. Right. You know, it's not as close to you, so I can kind of see that. I actually I put a, a buyer and a seller on a, on a for sale by owner. We all went in, and, and he right in the living room, he he lowball offered her right there. She was so offended because it was so emotional. Yeah. And we have an agent that works for us that, that we're selling their house as well. And they want to do the showings. And I, have, and I said, no, you can't do the showings of your own house. <laughs> you know, they're walking by and there's your picture on oh, the yeah, wall. Yeah. It's, like, it's way too emotional. Yeah, yeah. And when you're choosing an agent, I mean, this is something that I think is important. You know, you kind of have these niches or at least geographical, geographically where you are. Can you speak to that a little bit? Like, I mean, you're, you're in the Newport County area. Mm -hmm. You know, I would go for someone in that area versus someone that doesn't know the area. I mean, those are, what are some specific traits that they should look for in a real estate agent? Well, that, that matters. I mean, luckily we're in the state of Rhode Island, so we're not, in, you know, um, like Florida, you can't, you know, if you're not in a board of realtors, you can't sell in different counties. Rhode Island, you know, we can drive anywhere in pretty much 40 <laughs> minutes, right? So right. it's not too bad. Um, our office, HomeSmart, is based out of Warwick, and they're the number one size office in the state of Rhode Island. Wow. So we, you know, from there we can pretty much get anywhere. I mean, my office is in Middletown, and obviously, you know, Newport County, we've been number one for seven of the last eight years, so we know the market really well. Yeah. You know, so that's, of course, those are the things you're looking for. You're also looking for a track record. Yeah. How many houses they sell? Now, I'll give you a, a very vague statistic. Newport County, there's roughly 500 agents. 
125 of those agents sold four homes or more last year. Okay. So that means 375 sold three or less in a calendar year. That's, you know, so you, you want to look at track record for the agent. You want to see their experience, you know, how, how well did they sell real estate. Yeah. You know, yeah. Can you reach them if, if they have another job? Are they available to talk to you at 11 o'clock on a Monday morning? Are they busy with doing something else? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, wanna, I know we're running out of time, but I actually want to go just a little bit longer with you here because this one, you know, to me is when you sell a home, uh, price it to leave room for negotiation. I love that one. Um, I mean, that one. one, there's a few others that I have here, but I, I didn't want to miss that one. I think right. that's important. Uh, can you speak to that? Well, there, there's a few things. You hear it all the time. Well, let's put a little on top so we can negotiate. <laughs> it's, it's like anything else. It's like golf, right? If you get a four on the hole, the number's the number, right? It's, it's, so a bank appraiser looks at what the comparable sales are selling for, and that's how the buyer gets their financing. Mm -hmm. So you can't, you can't fluff up your number too much because then it won't appraise and you'll be back to where you are. The other thing you want to remember is you always want to – your first three or four weeks are your best time to sell at the highest volume. Mm -hmm. So if you kind of those three weeks and you kind of plateau, and well, then it slows down. And that's what I'm calling in 30 days. Say, hey, Rob, we overpriced it. We, you know, we should probably adjust that price now. Yeah. So you really want to try and price it correctly and be in that first three or four weeks to get your offer because that's, that's really the sweet spot for the highest price. Great. Uh, my last question to you is, you know, we talk about budgeting, and I yep. want to kind of bring everything together a little bit. If someone comes in, they know the budget, and I think this ties into the pre-approval, right. how much does it help your job that they come to you and they say, here's the range that I can afford? and how important that budgeting is. Is that helpful, obviously? Well, I think course. we kind of already talked about that. But. Well, a lot of times when they go to pre-approval, buyers forget about the taxes and the homeowner's insurance and, yeah. and flood insurance is such a big one now. Right. So, you know, those things all have to be budgeted in at the pre-approval. It makes, I don't want, once again, if you're approved to 300, I don't want to show you $400,000 houses and say, oh, they're going to negotiate. Yeah, yeah. You know, they're going to take 25% off because they like me so much. Yeah, great. So you got to think so. about those things. All right, thank you very Thanks, much. Uh, as always, when we return, we're going to talk about the stock market, if there's a correction in sight, and how to prepare for it. We'll be right back.